I'm good to go. Just take cool. it away. All right, so now we're moving into the second part of our self-improvement segment, our self-improvement exercises. So for the past week, we've been doing a daily self-love exercise, um, similar to the gratitude exercise we did before that. Basically, each day you try to think of and write down some things you love about yourself. And it sounds like a very simple exercise, but a lot of people actually find it really difficult. So yeah. how did that go for um, you this past week? Did you find it difficult or...? No, uh, I mean, I didn't find it very difficult. Like, as you said, we did the gratitude exercises last week, and um, both of these exercises are pretty similar to each other. So kind of, uh, I mean, I think I've mentioned before that I, it had been regular practice for me for months before this to do the gratitude exercises. Um, and so having that practice, it wasn't really that hard to kind of transition over. Um, you know, the thing that's different about it is when you're doing gratitude exercises, it's very, I mean, I kind of look back at what I had written down for the gratitude exercise and nothing, um, almost nothing on there was things I was grateful for um, that I myself had kind of, they weren't things about me or the things I'd done. Um, they were all external yeah. things. Um, I think that's probably fairly normal. Yeah, no, I think it is too. And so the... You know the thing that's helpful helpful about doing the self love exercises is it kind of yeah well it literally forces you to do that, mm -hmm. um, and I kind of talked last week about how doing the gratitude exercises helps you or help me at least kind of see things differently. Um, you know I could look at situations that previously I had looked at and said well this is kind of crappy and you know put a positive spin on it or actually not even to put a positive spin on it but actually looked a little bit deeper and said huh you know this is actually an opportunity for personal growth or etc um, and so kind of similar like I do these in the morning um, you know first thing first thing of the day basically after right waking up um, and just like with the gratitude um, exercise actually I know a lot of people kind of do something similar to this like a self affirmations basically um, right but I found kind of with the affirmations you're generally trying to go for something that you will be like you know I will exactly. be strong today um, and I find I like these better because you're you're looking at things that you you you're looking at positive qualities that you already have, um, and possibly finding positive qualities that you have that you hadn't really thought about before. Because um, definitely, just like, as, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, you can definitely have a preference for one or the other, but they aren't they're not mutually exclusive. Like I do, like you can definitely do both, and I think they're both uh, valuable. For sure. But, um, yeah, they are different things. Yeah, and so kind of the same, you know, when you're doing a couple of these every day, you kind of quickly run out of the things that are, um, you know, forefront in your mind. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, you kind of have those big positive qualities about yourself. Um, you know, I am, like for me, I just, one of my big ones is that I'm resilient. Like I can just take a bunch of crap and I just keep on going. Um, you know, obviously I haven't been feeling the greatest for the last month for just all these reasons that keep coming in and right. I've managed to you know, kind of shrug them off and just keep going and not let it affect me too much. Um, you know, I let it affect me as much as I need to, to just stay healthy, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm able to stay in mostly positive spirits. For sure. Just, just like, uh, yeah, for the listeners, um, like we, our recording has been a little uneven this week, but I will tell you that Alaric has had a lot of like genuine, like really reasonable excuses to not do the show, and the fact that he still is doing it as much as he is, it, it is very resilient. So, well, I agree with that one. But so yeah, so you kind of have those basic, you know, you have those things that you kind of know, like some people. I had the really obvious ones like they're musical or they're they're really empathetic or they're people person people people um, um, you know all those basic things like that and once you kind of exhaust those major qualities that are sort of right on the surface you kind of start um, you know you start finding other interesting ones like you know for me for sure. I've just been really happy that I'm not a picky eater, not even not a picky eater, but like I embrace like all food basically. Like it, there are a couple things I don't like to eat, but for the most part, I'm okay eating 
a whole variety of foods, and I'm also okay eating a, uh, I mean, not a variety of foods. I'm okay eating like, and I like eating the same things over and over, it, like if I have to. And that's been helpful recently because I've, it's allowed me to kind of bring my budget down. Uh, I've managed to shrink my food budget like massively because I have been okay kind of eating the same things. Yeah. No, you're you're one of the people. Uh, one of the few people I know who readily will eat crickets and worms, so I think it's safe to say you're not too picky. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, being, I think it's almost more impressive the other way, the fact that you are able to eat the same thing over and over again when you have to and not go crazy, because that's definitely something I struggle with. Yeah. But regardless, like, that's that's not something that I, you know, if somebody asked me to list my positive qualities, that's not something that would come... You know, it's not one of the first things I think about, but um, this exercise, once you, you know, since I'm trying to think of uh, two or three different things every single day, once I exhaust those more obvious ones, I kind of start to realize more things about myself that are pretty cool. Um, or, you know, sort of realize things that I might have thought were not so great before, and I kind of, you know, figure out how to or figure out that they are great or not, you know, hound myself too much about them. Um, so yeah, it's been a good exercise for sure. For um, sure. Yeah. How about you? Oh well. Oh, so I did have a, I guess, kind of a theory about you were talking about like there's, the obvious ones that are front of mind that, you go through first, mm -hmm. um, and you can confirm if this is true. But, as you were listing them, I kind of seemed to notice a pattern. Those are like the obvious front of mind ones. Would you say those are the ones that other people tend to tell you? about yourself um yeah i i think like not like i mean they're I, mean, I think they're all true but like the fact that you're talented musically i mean that's obviously something that no for sure and i mean i wasn't even saying those weren't qualities that i was listing for myself i was just saying like you know those are the things that most people i feel would kind of go to first like Mm -hmm. I guess I am talented musically, but I haven't really, I mean, I used to be talented musically. I don't really know if I still am. I, I mean, I'm sure I still am, but that's like some, you know, I think of certain people and, it, you know, even if I've asked them, it's, it's those things that kind of make up their identity, I think, in a way. And I think what a person's identity can be, can be influenced by, um, you know, what other people are sort of telling them. Um, it, I mean, I think there are certain instances where something like that is just, you know, if somebody is really super into music, is super good at practicing music, that's kind of part of their identity. I mean, people are going to be telling them, yeah, you're super musical. They're probably going to know it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess definitely most of the most of the ones I came to first definitely were things that other people have told me um at various points in my life like you know going back to the f um being okay or not being picky thing like uh I, maybe other than my parents like nobody has expressed to me hey it's really cool that you're not a picky eater um that's definitely not something that comes up in conversation so yeah i think you right. do kind of have a point there um the things that are forefront in somebody's mind i can definitely see being the ones that people are i maybe is that people are going to be more likely to pick up on them and so that's kind of you're thinking about them to begin with or maybe right. it's because the, you know people are also telling them um yeah i mean i think there could be multiple factors but yeah, yeah. no for like this is just true for me so i was wondering about other people but i think it's the same for me like the first ones to come to mind like i would say like oh i'm smart or good at learning or good at writing or things like that and I don't consciously realize it but it is things that other people have told me and I think what it is for me more than just them being front of mind because people mention them it's almost like you know uh, the whole reason of the self-love exercise to begin with the fact that people tend to be uncomfortable loving things about themselves um, I think those things come up first because at least for me they're almost like they're the things that are okay for me to love about myself because they're things that have been told me by other people. I'm not just mm. sitting here aggrandizing myself saying, oh, I think I'm a very good writer. I'm like, well, other people say I'm a good writer, so I guess that's true. Right. Um, so yeah. I think that's why 
it's difficult to come up with ones that someone else hasn't told you, but also when you get to that point, that's when you're actually doing the real work and that's when you're actually yeah. getting the full benefit. I mean, that, that makes sense. I, you know, I've kind of been sitting here thinking and like, you know, most of the ones that came up first for me, you know, just being intelligent, quick to learn, um, you know, being, uh, having, you know, taking initiative or being proactive, you know, all those kind of things. Like they're all sort of things that either teachers or uh, bosses that I've had my job, you know, basically authority figures have kind of told to me at some point. Oh, exactly. I mean, we could do a, like a whole show probably on what's it, what's it called? Like the something state, uh, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but like, oh, like fixed state intelligence or uh, it's like the ideas that some, and I think this probably applies more or less to us, uh, some people who are told a lot that they're intelligent as a child, like they get this idea that intelligence is kind of binary and either you're smart or you're not. And that feeds into like being really anxious to try new things because you're afraid if you try something new and you can't do it then it means you're not smart and since you're either smart or you're not like uh, does that make any sense um yeah i i guess i i don't think i've actually heard of this phenomena i mean it'd have to be something yeah i'm definitely but, mangling uh, the concept but it is a real thing it's like it yeah. i mean i could i could see that for sure um yeah like, I mean, it's good. Like, obviously, parents want to encourage their kids, but it's actually healthier for to comment on specific things. Like, oh, you're doing a good job learning this thing than saying, oh, you're so smart. Because, yeah. yeah, that's, I obviously need to go look this up again and do more research before I can talk about it intelligently. But anyway, yeah, I think okay. we definitely had the same experience of like our whole lives, like teachers and parents and people have been telling us, like, oh, you're smart. And yeah, yeah. for sure. And, you know, I definitely had that experience and, it's interesting ending i mean you know and there are differences between actually being intelligent and uh, i mean you can be intelligent and still uh, not it can be a bad thing sometimes i mean for me it, it kind of ended up being a bad thing because I, I you know i got through i got through high school i coasted through everything i didn't learn how to work at anything my entire life so you know then i hit college and i was since I had just coasted through everything without ever mm -hmm. studying in my life, I got there and just hit a wall because I'd never learned to do all the things that people actually need to learn how to do. Um, For sure. Anyway, we're kind of getting a little off topic here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, do do some research. I, I did a search for fixed state intelligence and couldn't find I any, probably, anything. But uh, yeah, um, probably right. anyway, so how was your experience with this exercise? Um, it was good. I'm kind of like you in that I've done the gratitude exercise and stuff before, and I've tried this self-love exercise, but not as consistently. Um, I mean, yeah, my major realization was the thing we just talked about, kind of that uh, the ones that are easier to come up with are the things other people have told me, and then it's more work to actually come up with things. I would say... It's one of those things where it gets easier for me mechanically to like, I'm easier at listing things because I've been doing the gratitude practice and then this practice, it's still difficult. The hard part is, and the important part is actually feeling the things. Uh, right. And that's something you do have to constantly remind yourself when you do exercises like this, you can write it down, but then you should actually take a moment and actually try to like feel love for yourself mm -hmm. about um, that thing. Yeah, I think I, I've kind of, I didn't do as good a job of that and I think part of that kind of goes back to like for the gratitude exercises it was much easier for me to feel gratitude um when i was talking about things that are happening outside of you know things that the universe is providing me that are making life awesome like it's so much easier to give gratitude for those things than it is to kind of you know feel just love myself for the things that i you know the hard work i have done or the things that are just good about me um you know part of that is just i I, well, I, I know it makes me, even though I'm not, you know, I'm not telling this stuff to anybody else, it still makes me feel like I'm bragging or I'm not being humble enough or, you know, or I, I'm sure this is some, an experience that probably almost everybody has going through this. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. 
that's kind of why yeah as we mentioned like this is kind of like a harder like this is difficulty two of the gratitude exercise it's mm -hmm. i think for most people definitely more difficult um yeah and i guess it's one of those things like meditation where i know you've been meditating forever and you're a buddhist so you're probably way past this but uh you know when people start buddhism a lot of times like they start out okay and then they get really frustrated when they hit that point where they keep realizing that their mind is wandering off and they're like oh i just can't focus anymore like i can't i don't know meditation's not working for me anymore yeah stuff like that and like that's actually that means you're getting good at meditation because the whole point is to become conscious of when your mind is wandering off and once you get to that point as frustrating as it feels that means you're actually getting there yeah for um, sure and i mean you know i've been meditating solidly for like eight years and i i still have problems mm -hmm. with that so i, I don't think that's sure. something that ever really goes away um for sure so i think it's the same thing here when like you were saying even though you're not like it feels like bragging or it feels wrong or uncomfortable somehow like you know there's that little voice inside of you when you like it almost feels like cheesy or like you're lying to yourself when you write it down like oh i love myself because i am smart or whatever or like because i'm great at writing and then there's a little voice inside your head that says like well like don't lie to yourself you know you're not that good at writing um that can feel very negative and uncomfortable but it's like you know it's cheesy that like knowing is half the battle but it once you actually identify it, you realize like, oh, I've never realized my entire voice there is, or my entire life there is this little voice telling me mm -hmm. these negative things. Like realizing that is very powerful and is the first step yeah. to figuring out why why do I have that little voice? Why do I feel that way? Sure. Or I mean, there is the flip side there too, where if you you know have that thought, you know, think you're awesome about something, then kind of feel like you might be bragging or you're not being super humble. There is that little bit of legitimization there. Where it's like, you know, I mean, this is only a problem if this is actually true. Like, I, or maybe not a problem because I guess you could be deceiving yourself. But I mean, you're having that thought. You're feeling bad. You know, for me, I kind of feel bad a little bit because I'm having that thought. And I realize, like, there's a bit of truth to it. And I, that's what makes me feel like I'm bragging. So, mm. um yeah, I mean, that's just kind of the uh, the foil there. But um, so, I mean, I think you kind of asked this question last time, but did you have any anything weird or interesting pop up yeah. that you hadn't really thought about before? Yeah, I was just grabbing this. Actually, I know you listed some of yours, so I'm going to skim over things I wrote down. Um... Yeah, it's funny. I actually, I obviously we're brothers, so we're going to have a lot in common, but it is interesting when we come up with the same things during these exercises. Like I wrote down that I love that I'm not easily discouraged by obstacles, which is basically the resilience thing. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like we were talking about, I did some of the basic ones, like being smarter, being a writer. Uh, some of the funny ones I wrote, I love that my hair grows so freakishly fast, <laughs> which like... I don't know if it's only starting recently or I hadn't noticed it before in my life, but like, yeah, I can, you know, last Halloween for a costume, I completely shaved my head bald and it was like a month till it was all back. And hmm. yeah, yeah, like it hasn't actually been that long since I've shaved my beard. It's yeah. I mean, like that's one for me. Like I kind of had the same thing. Not unfortunately not with my beard it takes like weeks to grow anything of note, but hmm. you know, my hair is so thick and grows so fast. I have to get like, haircuts constantly and previously i've always you know yeah i mean that's not one that came up for me in these exercises but that's another thing where now that you say that i mean yeah it's kind of nice i guess because it means i have more options to uh you know i can i could cut or style my hair differently if i wanted to uh, i mean at least yeah. i have hair and to begin with i have you know a nice healthy hair but up until now, I've only ever looked at that as a negative thing because it costs a bunch of money. Um, right. But yeah. yeah, I mean, so that is kind of border on the gratitude thing where it's technically something I don't have control over. But I mean, yeah. people beat themselves up all the time for physical things. So it's good to be able to love physical things about yourself, too. Definitely. Um, let's see. Uh, I did, but that I love that I listen to so many podcasts, which I know in earlier discussions we've had on the show, I kind of said that like during the hierarchy of values thing, 
Mm-hmm. I said it was kind of a negative sometimes because I almost get addicted to the podcast and listen to them instead of doing other things. Yeah. But I took the chance in this exercise to recognize there is a very good side to it too, where like so many of just the random facts I know or ideas I have or perspectives I get on events come from just the wide range of podcasts that Definitely. I listen to. I mean, I kind of had actually i think it was even only yesterday i was kind of beating myself because i just been re you know having felt a little under the weather recently i've been reading so many books and i started kind of getting uh not upset with myself but i was just looking at it and going man like i'm not I, i'm just reading books i'm not doing anything productive or useful even though right. i mean yeah that's kind of a really silly way to think about it because first i can you know i could be doing something way more um unproductive with my time like you know that's brain food i just having and I, I feel also like i'm just kind of making up for you know i've been reading a lot recently but probably a good five years before you know this year i had just not been reading as much uh, as i want to so it's just kind of catching up but yeah i kind of had a similar thought for sure where, yeah, i do take things to extremes but that all in itself can also be a positive as well. Um, Definitely. For many uh, yeah, like, it is kind of a fallacy, especially in our Western society where we're trained to be so productive. Like, we kind of get this false sense that if we enjoy anything too much, it must not be good for you. Yeah. Um, so I've had that too, where it's like, oh, like, I'm just slacking off and having fun reading some Hemingway and, like, yeah, we're actually, a lot of people would say reading Hemingway is a good use of your time. Uh, and we'll be talking a lot about Hemingway a bit later in the show, but same with, um, yeah, I can't remember who said the quote originally. It was Tim Ferriss who conveyed it to me because I listened to his podcast and he shares the wisdom of a lot of other uh, great people. Mm-hmm. But just the thing that, like, uh, to find success, like, find the thing that's easy for you or enjoyable for you or ideally both that's difficult for others. Yeah. Um, okay. I was talking about this last time we were, we were recording that like with my writing, because it's a job now, I feel like, Oh, it's too easy for me. I must not be writing very well. And I tried to like, I tried to make the writing difficult for myself and then it comes out not as good. And it's just the fact that like, you know, I feel like they're paying me for nothing. Cause I'm like, Oh, this is so easy. Like anyone could do this. Why are they paying me for that? Well, the fact that it is that easy for me and some people just can't write at all, like means that's my strength and I should steer into that. Uh, yeah. I mean, so for you, the fact that you can, like a lot of people find reading really difficult and you find it fun. So that's, uh, yeah, that's definitely a strength you have that you can utilize in a lot of ways. For sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, reading isn't itself a career, but that means, you know, research and things like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is a it is a skill utilized in many careers or activities, for sure. Definitely. Uh, so did you have anything else to say about our self-love um, exercise, or should no, we kick off the next one? Not really. I, I think I've kind of gone over everything I wanted to say. Uh, it's been great, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, as we're kind of going through these, I'm going to I'm going to have to sort of feel out like how how many of these things do I want to be doing at a time? Because I mean, you know, the, so far, I think probably what I'm going to be doing is just having, you know, I'll sort of relegate these things to I think that I do when I first wake up, probably won't be writing them down every single day. But I do find it's a good exercise for when I first open my eyes. Um, like it, it feels like actually doing something, even if I'm just thinking about these questions. Um, but I don't have to. I don't have to move. I don't have to be like, you know, I don't have to be doing anything. But it kind of it's a nice transition. I mean, aside from all the benefits of just kind of getting in the right frame of mind. Yeah. Um, you know, because if you're thinking Starting about your day on a happy note. Yeah, if you're thinking about positive things or you know figuring out how to think about things positively, it just translates um, into a better mood for the rest of your day. So it's got that benefit. Um, you know, it's quick. It's something that will get my brain kind of moving, but also doesn't feel like anything too intense. So it's a good transition. Um, but you know, if we do 50 weeks from now or something, I'm, you know, not probably not going to wake up and go through 50 different exercises. So I'll have to kind of figure out how all this stuff fits into my day. Um, you know, for sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I mean, that's a good point though. We always, 
encourage listeners to play along with us, and we do a different exercise each week. Um, I mean, now that you mentioned that, we might return to some exercises on some weeks if we find we have more to say about them. Yeah. Uh, in any case, yeah, even though we are doing a new one each week, like definitely if you can or if they appeal to you, uh, keep doing them and like layer them on top of each other. Uh, like the gratitude and self love for both of them, you're just writing it can take a little while, but usually not that much. So I definitely think exercises you can very easily include in mm-hmm. your day. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, the point of all of this is finding new, uh, you know, new exercises, new habits that you can kind of incorporate into your life. Um, so yeah, take exactly. what works, leave what doesn't. Um, yeah. For sure. So for now, we're going, this one is a little different. We're going to be moving into a set point exercise. Set um, points. And once again, we're working from... The Code of the Extraordinary Mind by Vishen Lakiani. Uh, it's a great read. You should pick it up. Um, yeah. So the next exercise we have is set points, which is... Uh, so this is kind of going into what he calls systems for living. So we talked last time, or last segment, about the models for reality, which is uh, basically the idea that what you believe about the world kind of determines what is true for you. Uh, Even if it's not objectively true, if you act according to some thought, then that thought is very literally driving your actions. Um, So the other half that he lays out is the systems for living. So he kind of, it's like models of reality is kind of like your software and systems for living is kind of like your, or I'm kind of getting the, metaphor wrong i think but systems for living are kind of like okay maybe models of reality are your hardware and then systems for living are kind of like he describes them as apps that you can put on your phone like you can download a new app for your life so these would include what we've talked about a lot and we do a lot with is like routines and habits if you try to set a new habit or you have a new routine that is a system for living that you're putting into practice right um so a good way to establish those, like we're all familiar, I've done this millions of times, where you like establish a new habit, but you start it out consistently and then it slowly becomes less and less and you eventually just stop doing that. Does that sound familiar? That sounds very oh. familiar. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> the idea of set points is it's a s- simple way to, uh, you basically you establish a habit or a goal or something and it's a simple way to make sure that you keep it going. Um, yeah, so basically he calls them non-negotiable set points. A set point is simply a bare minimum threshold you establish for yourself that you promise you will not go below. Uh, a set point differs from a goal. Goals pull you forward while set points help you maintain what you have. You need both. Um, so when I was first reading this book, I found this really interesting because I'm really good at establishing goals, I think, and keep uh, trying to hit them. <clears throat> But, well, okay, if you've ever worked out, this is going to sound familiar, where there's plateaus in working out, and they can be very, they're normal, but they can be very demotivating, where, like, uh, the first time, I don't know, you can do, like, three deadlifts with however much weight, and then you can do four, and then you can do five, and then you get stuck at five, and it's months before you go past that, and it can feel, like, super demotivating, and that can be a time where you kind of fall off your habits because you're not making progress anymore. Um but this is a different way of tracking progress is even if you aren't getting below five, you can at least make sure you're not falling below three, for example, oh, yeah. and have that be your goal and focus on the lower end instead of the higher end. Um, yeah. So an example he has is he has a set point where he wants to always be able to do 50 push ups. That's like he's way ahead of me in the fitness, mm-hmm. but yeah, basically, he'll sometimes it's okay for him to take a break from working out or okay, like over Christmas to eat a lot of junk food or whatever. Just his minimum goal is that he always needs to be able to drop and do 50 push ups. So, where, yeah, this is building on the models of reality, or not, sorry, the 12 areas of balance that we've been coming back to. Yeah. Um, we're not going to do a set point for all of them because that's a lot. We're mm-hmm. just going to, well, when we first talked about our, uh, areas of balance, we gave them scores. So you're specifically going to be 
focusing on the lower scores or the ones that you just want to improve the most. So you probably don't need a set point for your learning, for example. That's yeah, already I'm going to have to, oh, I need to maybe pull up my... Oh, that's fine. It doesn't have to be actually like mathematically the lowest. Just if you think about your life and think about the areas that. All right, well, I'm you just gonna to pull up my my little sheet here, uh, just because I can't. I wouldn't be able to list all the areas balanced if I had to. Okay. Um, right. Just have to navigate so, Google. No worries. While you're pulling that up. Uh, I'll just go through the steps. So first you identify the areas of your life where you want to create set points. So look back at the 12 areas of balance in which categories did you score the lowest? Where are you slipping? Pick two or three to focus on for what you'd like to set specific achievable set points. Uh, eventually you can expand your list to like include them all, but start with a few that are most important to you. Step two, you determine your set points. Um, so create targets for each area you've selected. Uh, this is very important. Make sure that your set points are absolutely achievable. Right. Uh, for things you can measure, for example, your weight or your bank account, establish specific amounts. My weight set point is X, or my bank account set point is Y. Uh, you can establish in, uh, set points for your intellectual life by saying, I will read X books per month, or for work, I will spend two hours a week researching or studying something that will make me better at my job. The more specific you are, the easier it will be to keep track of the set points and actually stick with it. Um, and then he lists example set points for all the areas of balance. It would take a long time to read through them all, so I think we'll choose the set points we want to work on first, and then I'll read the examples from there, and we can all right. see which ones um, we work. Okay. So, yeah, I've got, got my list up here. Um, yikes. Yeah, all my low ones, I mean, obviously the ones that I'm not doing so well on are the ones that are kind of, I, you know, I'm obviously having some difficulty there, so I'm looking at the end and just going, ooh, yikes, I have to, I have to deal with these ones. Um, yeah, no, I have the exact same feeling, but, like, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, the ones that immediately jump out for me are um, my friendships, my adventures, and my career. All of those are, and I'm looking at this and going, huh, I, my life is... Most of these ones are kind of on the, you know, between the 5 and, and 10 area. And it's probably just because we have this thing where we really like that number 7. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I would say, so, I mean, I know you are kind of a veteran of self-improvement, and you probably can tackle the scarier ones. But for anyone following along at home, if you have some... Um, if you have some that are really low and they're kind of like intimidating for you to tackle, it might actually be, you could start by tackling a middling one, like maybe a five where mm -hmm. it's not the lowest and it's not the hardest area for you, but it's still somewhere where you have a lot of room to improve. Yeah. And actually speaking of that, because maybe not everyone will listen to every podcast. I think I will just quickly list the 12 areas again, for sure. just so you can follow along this with this exercise. So those would be uh, your love relationship, your friendships, your adventures, your environment, your health and fitness, your intellectual life, your skills, your spiritual life, your career, your creative life, your family life, and your community life. Right. So yeah, I mean, there are ones like, you know, if I was just going for a middling one first, uh, my creative life, uh, as uh, that's one where, you know, I have that listed down uh, as a five. Obviously, I, I like to be doing a little bit more writing, uh, you know, pot possibly a lot more writing um you know i'd even like to be working on this podcast more um and i'd like to just find other areas where i can kind of uh do creative things without it being a thing that's like i'm aspiring for it to, you know even aspiring for it to be some sort of career or major point of life in my life even um even though that aspiration might be a more subconscious thing like with writing but for the most part i'm doing writing because i like writing but I always kind of have that thing like oh I, this is something I could make money on someday in the back of my head um, for sure so you know it's kind of funny I'm thinking about that now because today I was down at the beach and I was just looking at all the pebbles in the sand and start, you know I, I just found a couple that were similar to each other hard to explain they were just like all smooth and almost like had a little bit of luster to them and it's just a certain type of rock and i was like hmm, i'm gonna try to find all the rocks like this because maybe i'll put them in a bowl or something 
And very quickly, I realized that I don't take enough time to just do things that are pointless. And pointless sounds like a negative thing, but I realized that like, almost everything I do, there has to be some point to. Like, you know, if I'm doing something and there isn't some outcome that puts me objectively further ahead in some area um, than I am currently, I immediately have a just kind of a sour taste about it because I'm like, hmm, you know, that that's not useful. It doesn't get me anywhere. For um, sure. But it's... just kind of spending like 20, 30 minutes to just like dig around in the sand and just pick up rocks. And, you know, probably everybody on the beach was looking at me just going like, what is that guy doing? Um, I realized like I need to do more things that are just pointless. Like, you know, I, I guess I kind of had a point in that I'm going to put the rocks in a bowl. But um, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was very soothing, and it was kind of what inspired me, you know, I have, at some point this week, I'll talk about my segment, and I kind of have a new topic for it, and, you know, I guess it's getting off topic a little bit again, but I think it kind of comes back to attention and just letting my attention not be monopolized. Um, mm. Yeah, I need to do more of that. So if you're ever at the beach and uh, want to just calm down, just dig through the sand and find some rocks. It's actually very fun. Um, yeah, that does actually sound fun. It's nice. Uh, so coming back to you know the, my creative life on the the twelve. Areas oh, actually. Like, oh, to sorry. Dive further into this tangent, but I do think it's a really good one. And okay, I mean, that's okay. The point of this podcast is to have interesting conversations, and if we For sure. if our topics spark interesting conversations, then great. Uh, sorry, that train of thought is slipping away. Uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about, I mean, that's obviously very relatable for me. And I think very relatable in Western society in general, probably even more so in a place like Japan. But anyway, the idea that everything we're doing has to have a purpose or else we're, quote, wasting time. Um, I mean, that's one reason why mindfulness meditation is becoming so popular, because a lot of people do struggle with that. And mindfulness is kind of the answer mm. to that uh, in a way. Uh, sorry, that sounded like you might disagree, or... Oh, no, no, I mean, that's, you know, I'm going to be talking about all of this, and mm -hmm. on it, you know, obviously I didn't want to talk about the problems that are afflicting our society without providing some of the answers, so, you know, and that obviously was one of the answers that I was going to come mm -hmm. up with, is, you know, I have, I have a few of them I'll be talking about, uh, but meditation... Sorry if I was stealing your... Oh, no, uh, not at all. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously I want to talk about it, because that's something, you know, it's is interesting to me so um for sure yeah. yeah it's i mean that's not my own wisdom or anything that's literally i have a medication uh, or sorry medication a meditation app that i use that that's how it kind of presents it uh so that's why i had that thought in my mind yeah uh in any case the way i was going with that is i've noticed this about my own behavior do you feel like that feeling is almost like a defense mechanism where I've had certain points in my life where, for example, uh, something like uh, something goes wrong in my life or a problem happens that could have been avoided and it specifically could have been avoided if I had done more work in mm -hmm. some area. Like I don't have quite enough money to pay a bill that was due and someone comments to me uh rightly but they're like well if you had spent a more a little more time working like this wouldn't have been a problem and then going forward every time i'm thinking like oh i should do this thing that doesn't really have a point you know even if i've worked as much as a reasonable person could be expected or even if i at that point can pay my bills it's just this lingering leftover like defense mechanism that in my head that's like i have to spend all of my time doing something productive because then nobody will be able to call me out on yeah on like if anything like bad things could still happen in my life but they're not my fault because i've done everything i could do which yeah. is a very understandable frame of mind but obviously you don't want to go through your whole life living defensively you want to be living proactively which no the first no 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 i'm saying yeah i was gonna say no for sure oh yeah um, yeah okay but yeah i kind of have a similar feeling where you know and it's almost more put upon myself where anytime somebody is looking at me or considering my position in life or, you know, what I'm doing, anything like that, I'm always, you know, I'm obviously kind of jumping to the worst conclusion, but uh, part of it comes from people asking me, you know, like, you know, what are you doing with your life? What are your plans? Like, I, I always feel like I need to have a plan for everything. Like, I, I need to, I feel like I need to be going somewhere kind of because 
I mean, sort of similar reasons. I'm. It does kind of, it's sort of a proactive way to cut off those questions of, you know, what are you doing? Where are you going? What are your plans? Like, you know, how are you going to survive in life? How are you going to be successful? Um, all these things, which, you know, for the most part, I'm sure a lot of people aren't, well, they're not going to ask me. I, maybe some of them are thinking it, like, you know, what's this guy doing? Where is he going? Um, but, yeah, uh, I... I do, I, I mean, yeah, I've kind of just had a very similar experience to yours. I mean, I think, I'll, again, a lot of it is just kind of me putting all that pressure on myself to kind of succeed. Um, and sure. it, it's kind of, you know, I always try to figure out ways that things could end up, um, uh, or, you know, I feel like even if something I'm doing isn't something that, you know, if I'm, doing something that doesn't get me anywhere immediately, I still feel like it needs to kind of be a skill in my back pocket that I could, you know, pull out at some time. Like, I always feel like it just has to be useful. Um, and I think part of it is, you know, I try to always kind of be growing and progressing. Um, you know, partially, I think most things you do in life kind of do have you growing and progressing, which is why it kind of feels like if I'm doing something that I can't measure my progress in some way, then I feel like, oh, there's all of these different things that I could be doing with my time to grow and progress. But I have managed to choose the, you know, the thing that is in the minority <laughs> that doesn't yeah. have me growing and progressing in some objective For way, sure. um, which is silly. And, you know, I kind of, it's one of the things I'll be talking about where you are, since our attention is so monopolized, our attention is a resource. And, uh, you know, I'm going to make the argument that it's almost as important as like water or food or sleep. Um, you know, kind of just because if we don't have the power to have attention and kind of have agency, then it's almost like we're not living because For sure. we're kind of in that autopilot state. Um, yeah, I'm so, very much looking forward to your segment this week. Yeah, kind of just having that power to sort of reset. Um, I, I mean, it, it's super important. So you know, it is, you are growing. Like you, if you, by just doing things that are you know mindless or pointless, you're giving yourself rest. You're giving yourself a chance to reset so you're at full capacity to actually uh, really integrate the things that might actually have you pressing in life. So, yeah. Right. And I mean, um, also, they're, like you say, they're pointless, but there is a reason you're doing it. You might not consciously realize it, but obviously something in you had that desire to collect those stones. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like we put so much effort into improving or producing the things that we think we're supposed to be doing but it can be hard like it can be hard to figure out what you actually really want out of life and that's a question a lot of times you ask it and people freeze up uh so that is kind of the point of mindfulness like the first step to figuring out what you actually want to be doing is kind of clearing yourself of all the things you don't really want to be doing um so i i mean this gets really abstract and cheesy but like something about you know, there's something in you that has the impulses to do things like collect a bunch of stones and put them in a bowl. And yeah. that, and... yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, this is a hard topic to explain. But basically, there are these drives in you that drive you to do certain things that would make you happy. And there's probably bigger versions of that that would drive you toward the career that you would really love to be doing. And yeah, possibly. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, part of me kind of, the part that doesn't like that I'm doing something pointless kind of maybe thinks a bit that, like, you know, if I'm kind of just going on autopilot here, just doing what I want, you know, the things I want, sometimes they have just been not, you know, sometimes maybe I think they're just instinctual or, you know, more animalistic things and they're things that, you know, I shouldn't be necessarily be doing what I want. It kind of, I think it kind of goes back to that thing where you were saying, yeah, if, it, if I'm having fun with something, there must be, you know, it must not be work, it must not be useful, all those right. things. So, yeah. In any case, um, I think I will save everything I have to say about this for my segment because a lot of it is kind of interconnected and I sort of need to build on it and everything. Um, right. What were we even talking? Oh, the... Um, set points, yeah. Set points. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to kind of give an example. So going back to my creative life. My creative life I have listed as a 5 out of 10 for, you know, how I f how, how satisfied I am with it within those 12 areas of balance, um, you know, um, 
I don't do anywhere. I have outlets which I use for creativity. I don't attend to them as much as I'd like and maybe don't have as many of them as I'd like. But one thing I can, you know, it's very easy for me to kind of look at that and go, you know, one thing I really can do is I can just say, you know, at least three times a week, I want to, you know, sit down and either write or be outlining, you know, some working on my novel for at least 30 minutes, three times a week. I think that like, Great. yeah, I mean, it's fairly, it's minimal. It's, I think the important thing is that's actually significantly less, less than I want to be doing. But I think I need to set my absolute lowest as significantly less because, you know, I'm probably going to, I'm not going to be doing as much as I want to be doing right off the bat. Or at least, definitely. I should I, yeah, we're getting. I, I, sure. you know, it's possible I might not be doing as much as I want to be. I, I believe I can, but just in case, I will set it a bit lower. For sure. Yeah, we're getting a little ahead of where we're at in the exercise, but yeah, I mean, we definitely have just the kind of an example of one that is a little easier oh, for me yeah. to look at. And then I have the other ones like, you know, my career is at a two. I look at that and go, oh boy, I don't even know. Um, one second. I'm going to relocate this spider to the outside. Oh. Alrighty then. I will do my best to fill the air. Um, yeah, so like I said, we were getting a little ahead of the steps, but Alaric definitely had the gist of it there, where the goal for set points is to set it below the maximum you can do. If you, for example, you can deadlift 200 pounds five times, you don't want that to be your set point, uh, you would say maybe I should always be able to at least do one rep of 200 pounds to know I'm not slipping too far. Um, oh. Okay. Yeah. Spider successfully relocated. Awesome. I was just talking a little bit about uh, how, like you were saying, it should be, your set point should not be the max you can do. It should be below that. Right. Um, all right. So you, yeah. We want to identify two or three areas to focus on. So it sounds like creativity is definitely one. Uh, do you think you wanted to try for one of the low intimidating ones or would I, you like to just I think the so. Um, yeah, I mean, All this right. is something we can kind of brainstorm a little bit here instead of just feeding me to the walls and letting me deal with it on my own time. So let's just, shall we just say, let's do three of them today? For sure. Um, yeah, maybe I'll I mean, go for if a you're, middle... If you're doing a really difficult one, you might want to stick to two but it is up well to i mean i was going to do kind of the middle one the creative life my career and then kind of one that i have more towards you know a higher end so it's not that you know something that i kind of oh, i feel sure. like yeah, i can I kind of incorporate structure i have in my life already because well, again i'm trying to take things that i already sort of do every day or you know every week and kind of incorporate them into my planning and structure because it's kind of like a gimme but still yeah. gets me the habit of actually creating that structure so i do think that is a good way to do it. actually i was thinking of one of my answers um i think i don't actually have my answers handy but i think i did rate my work fairly high because i am like writing for a living and stuff or i don't know if this would fall in work or creativity but basically my writing is something that i would rate fairly high already but i can think of a fairly simple set point that would improve it even more. So I definitely want to include that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, um, so, what, what are you, okay, so what are you, uh, so I think I'm just going to work on my intellectual life, or not work on it, but I'm going to make a set point for my intellectual life. Oh, really? That, that um, one's already at 10. That's like as high as it can go. Well, that's why I'm saying I'm going to use that yeah. and I'm going to take some of the structure I already have there. Um, For sure. And yeah, I'm just going to say this is my minimum, basically. So I already have one that I'm Definitely. going to be guaranteed to. Yeah, I mean, I kind of gave the reasons already. So um... For my gimme one, I mean... This does, for me, kind of span work and creativity because my writing is my work right now, but I also do a lot of writing for fun in my free time. And I think I'll just file this under creativity. Uh, yeah, so my kind of gimme one will be creativity. It's already something I think I do pretty well on in my life, but I can improve it even more. Uh, I haven't really... 
just for a look behind the scenes, I don't really think about these or plan them out before the show. I try to give my fresh takes, so I actually don't know yet which ones I'm going to try to improve. Right. Let's see. For a middling one. Hmm. You know, my skills might actually be a really good one. I've talked about this before, where I have some random skills, not anything that would go into a career or anything, just fun things like playing the piano and drawing and photography that I'm really interested in, but they do tend to fall by the wayside when I have other things going on in my life. So, yeah, yeah I do think I'll put down skills. I think I rated that one a five because it's something I have skills that I'm good at, but I kind of haven't dusted them off in a long time. So, skills... And then, yeah, the scary one. Uh, let's see, what were my low ones? Oh dear. What? I'm just on my wrong account for the... Uh, on my tablet, I'm on my other, my gaming Twitch oh. TV account, not the podcast oh. one. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. All right, um, so should I just kind of go first for one? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, in the chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Drexy TV is Alaric. Yeah, that's me. He, yeah. Wrong account or right account. I don't know. Yeah. It's my account. It's all that matters. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I might actually have to do social life, too, for my more difficult one. Yeah. I mean, well, we obviously don't have to do three. We can, I mean, yeah, hopefully no, I, we'll I be, I mean, I guess we'll be going. So I guess that's actually a question for this week. Having like 12 things to kind of work on all at once seems like it might be a bit of a handful. So we should probably. Oh, no, that, that's what I was saying. We're not, that's okay. why we're choosing two or yeah. three. We're not, I, I see. We're not doing 12. I thought we were just going to, yeah, my mind wasn't working. Don't mind oh. me. No worries. We haven't, yeah, I haven't read the full steps yet, so. Yeah. Okay, I'll put down social. Oh, wait, you didn't put social, you put career. Never mind. Yeah, I put my career. Yeah, I got confused there. Okay, cool. Uh... Cool. Sorry, we're a bit scattered this episode, but. All right, so we selected a few areas. Hopefully, you at home also decided on a few areas. Uh, like we said, they shouldn't all be ones that you're already really good at, but they don't have to be the ones that are really difficult yet. You can get to that later. Uh, if you have some middling ones that can, you could be, you know, you could improve them. Uh, that's perfectly fine. So step two is to determine your set points. So you create set point targets for each area you've selected. Uh, wait, I already read this part. Uh, oh yeah. We were going to read the examples from the areas we chose. Right. So, can you tell it's past my bedtime? Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, okay, so your first one was your creative life. Indeed. So, here's the examples it gives in the book. You can use any of these, modify them, or come up with your own. Choose and pursue a creative outlet and set a reachable set point for making it part of your life. It could be spending 20 minutes journaling each day joining a weekly improv class, or setting goals to move forward on a creative project that's been stalled or you've been meaning to start. I have set points for the amount of writing I do every week. Uh, so it sounds like you were already ahead of the game. You already have one for your writing. What was it, 30 yes. minutes? Yeah, 30 so minutes I think three times. 30 minutes three times a week. And OK, so one of, um, I, I've talked about, maybe I haven't talked about it specifically. I'm, so I'm in a group called Smart Recovery. It's uh, self-management and recovery training. Um, you know, it is a group for people, primarily for people who have, you know, suffer addiction issues. But the really cool thing about it is the course content, like you could take out any reference to addiction and it would just work for anybody, like especially anybody who has, um, like, you know, any, any sort of mental disorder, especially, you know, anything like depression, anxiety, uh, ADHD. So, you know, kind of right up my alley, but the cool thing about it is, so SMART stands for Self-Management and Recovery Training, um, and they have one of the points in it, or one of the, one of the things they do is SMART Goals, which is actually a different acronym, acronym sorry, 
So a SMART goal needs to be specific, measurable, attainable, reasonable, and time-bound. Um, and so for, you know, for just something like my creative life, like, you know, for these set points, I wouldn't want to say something like, um, you know, I want to, even just writing 30 minutes isn't good enough. So it has to be specific. Like the specific is kind of right. So I want to be doing writing. What kind of writing? I want to be working on my novel. Um, mm. You know, specifically the novel that I am working on right now, which doesn't have a name. But if I had a name, I would specify that name. Um, so it needs to be measurable. I've already got that in the 30 minutes, um, you know, three times a week. Uh, it needs to be attainable. Um, I, I think with a set point that kind of actually is sort of baked into this, like it needs to be, we're doing our bare minimum. Sure. So it needs to be something that we can attain, um, you know, each week. It needs to be reasonable, which, you know, kind of, it kind of is the same as attainable, but I mean, I guess not even the same as attainable. Attainable, you know, it could be attainable for me to write five hours per day. That doesn't mean it's reasonable. So I think right. 30 minutes per day is reasonable. And time bound, like this is more ongoing thing, so it's not quite a goal, but I still think this framework sort of works. But you know, it's time bound in For that sure. I want to be doing 30 minutes three times a week. And mo even more specifically, I can make this an even better, you know, smart goal or a smart, um, smart set point by just saying, I'm going to write 30 minutes, you know, three times a week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at two clock in the afternoon and in fact i'm just mm -hmm. gonna say that because i that's kind of I'll the time i want to be setting aside for writing um yeah so smart. yeah the more specific you can get uh definitely the better for sure so i'm just gonna write that down awesome while you're doing that i'm also going to start with my creativity goal uh just while we're on the subject um yeah mine was going to be similar except I I don't even know if I'll give a specific time for it. I would just say I should be writing my novel, specifically my own novel, not the one I'm doing for work. Um, just write that novel every day and not even any limits to that. Just mm. like at least one word, which sounds like it sounds like a laughably small set point, but it's for me because I know myself. Usually the hardest part of writing for me is actually sitting down and starting it if I you know it's sort of a binary thing where either I write zero words or if I write the first word then I usually end up writing a thousand All right and it's just like I said this is creativity I would already rank it pretty high for me and I write for a living and all that I don't necessarily have a problem writing a lot it's just you know I have so many projects going on that writing my own novel Obviously, it's like a huge dream of mine and an important thing to me, but it does kind of get pushed to the side for other more immediate things. And it's if if I followed this, if I actually did just sit down and write at least one word of this novel every day, like it would be published by now. So mm -hmm. that's just something I need to hold yeah. myself to. I mean, I guess that that is that's very very smart. Um, you know, I could see a similar no, like. I wouldn't be able to sit down and just write a word and just leave it there without all its friends. Um, like inevitably someone would come, but I, I think it's definitely a good good way to kind of get past a bit of that mental barrier. I mean, for me... Um, for sure. Know. It's actually, again, I said like I, it's a very personal to me set point because I know myself, so you should definitely tailor them to yourself. They don't need to be universal, but yeah. it's like a mistake I made where I actually have this really good kind of habit block that I don't know if you have any habits like this where if you do one like you get used to doing one thing and then another thing after that and another thing after that so it's like once you do the first part of the habit it gets really easy to do the next part mm -hmm. so again it's sort of a all or nothing thing where either I start it and I do all of them or I don't and then I do none of them but I have this really good habit set in the morning where I uh you know, after breakfast, usually I'll do whatever morning things I'll try to exercise. But then when I get into kind of the intellectual mode where I'm sitting down at a coffee shop and on my computer, I'll start out by uh, doing some nonfiction reading for an hour, like reading some sort of self-help book or educational book or whatever. Uh, do that for an hour. And then I'll spend, it usually takes about an hour to write my blog post for the day. And then uh, if I have any work for the day, I'll do that or writing for work. And then I try to do two to three hours of 
writing my own book at the end of all that. And because, like, you know, it is an important project and something I feel like I should be spending a lot of time on it because I assigned two to three hours to it. It's the one I most often don't get to because I feel like, oh, I just don't have it in, to, in. I don't have it in me to write for two hours right now. So I should just write for zero hours and zero mm -hmm. minutes and zero seconds, which is like when you say it out loud, that's a really stupid way of thinking. But that's how it goes in my head. It's like yeah. if I start, I'll have to write for two hours where really if I set a ridiculous goal of like this, where, OK, I should get in there and write one word, I probably would end up writing for two hours. No problem, because that's yeah. just how my mind works. Yeah, definitely. Um, for sure. Sorry, I think you were going to say something else there. Um, probably, uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I think it's probably kind of stuff you went over already, but I mean, yeah, I, I yeah. cut you off, so I feel bad. But. No, no, it's all good. I mean, I think I was just going to say, like, just beginnings. I, I think this goes for a lot of people, like just beginning things are, is the hardest part. Yeah. Um, beginning and even ending things is a little bit difficult for me. Like even when I'm writing a book or a story or anything, even an essay, like, the middle part of it, no problem. But actually sitting down and writing that introduction, that's the hardest part. Getting those first words in the sentence down. As soon as I just have words down on the page, it's very easy for me to rearrange them. You know, just keep going. But just writing with that first letter is definitely where I get hung up. Um, definitely. So, yeah. Um, no, I definitely I, think... I don't want to, like, put tangents on tangents and make this, like, a complete writing segment because that's not what... We can definitely talk about that sometime, but that's not what the segment is. But yeah, a really good, like, when you start writing, you just write something ridiculous that obviously isn't what happens. Like, an example I use is, like, just write, then the dead dog came back to life and started dancing. And so you just write that on the page, and then once it's there, you're like, well, that's obviously not what happens. So then you change it to what does happen, and then you're past that block of starting. I don't know. Works for me. But yeah. Yeah, and I mean, of course, every everybody is very, very different too. I mean, there, are, there are definitely things where, you know, getting. I, there are other. It was, I guess writing is always like that for me. There are certainly other things in my life where it's kind of flipped around. Like getting started with something is very easy, and you know, finishing it up is the hardest. Or even you know, certain things where just stopping is too hard. Like you know. Uh, playing video game. I mean, you know, obviously yeah. anything like that. It's like getting started. Binging Netflix. Yeah, getting started is like, an oh, easy point. One so, more episode. You know, it's the kind of thing where I, I mean, on there isn't really like a fun type thing on on here, but um, like you know, with my intellectual life, like some of these goals, like whatever I set out for my set point are you know going to be very easy and. I'm, it's all I almost feel kind of like I need to put a cap on some of that stuff like you know yeah. I spend all my time reading and you know just watching lectures and stuff to the detriment of everything else on this list um so sure. yeah I mean everybody's going to have a different experience of all this everybody's going to need to set out different set well, points set points I mean set points do kind of end up working that way like you're not necessarily putting a cap on your intellectual life but if you have a set point for say your work life or your career or whatever um and you don't let yourself fall below that then that by definition will stop you from taking all your time away into yeah. something else yeah i guess that's actually a good point um yeah okay so uh, did you yeah. was that all for your um your one there yeah for my creativity just writing just write my book every day okay so no yeah limits just... um so uh, as i said the other one of the points of balance I kind of want to establish a set point for is my intellectual life. Um, for sure. I, you know, um, yeah, I'll just read the examples he has here. Right. Yes. Before you go. Uh, it sounds like you probably have one in mind already, but yeah. just for the listening audience. All right. Intellectual life. Start to incorporate some systems for bringing intellectual richness into your life. It might be reading a few pages each night before bed, visiting a gallery or exploring one room of a museum each week. I mean, that sounds expensive. Don't museums usually charge you for um, admission? I mean, like, there there are, I mean, kind of stretching your definition of a museum, I'm, I guess I, you, I definitely run out of museums, but, you know, there are different things, like, you know, just as an example, um, a month ago when my aunt and cousin were up visiting, or our aunt and cousin, um, 
we we went to a little house. Like there's a there's a famous artist that lives, or I guess lived in Victoria, um, Emily Carr. Yeah, Emily Carr, um, and she just her house from mm -hmm. back in the early 1900s had basically kind of been like preserved, and so it's now it's a museum yeah. of sorts. And there's you know it's just kind of by like donation. the Frida Kahlo house here. Yeah, I imagine something very much like it. You know, it had the rooms, how she might, you know, her family might have lived in it. Um, you know, and I, I get the feeling that the whole thing was mainly to sell, like, I guess she was a writer as well. Um, so to, you know, sell books of her art and writing and stuff. But, you know, it was a nice little thing I could just drop in, you know, donate mm -hmm. five bucks or whatever and just kind of wander around. So there are, you know, if you stretch your definition of a museum, um, I definitely think you... And maybe you're somebody who just has disposable income, and you've decided that that is a no. I know I you know, worthwhile. I was income. mostly, I don't know, just making a joke. Like yeah. it actually is. There are a lot of free museums here in Mexico City, uh, and there actually is even the ones that do cost money. There's a uh, Noche de Museos each month. I think it's like the last, last or first Sunday of each month or something. Like there is a day when like all the museums are free. So yeah. Yeah, no, it definitely is a thing you can do. Cool. I just thought it was a funny example of like, if you're going to museums that cost money and you're only doing one room each week, yeah. that could add up. But oh, yeah, yeah sure. just ignore me. I'm just being sarcastic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, anyway. Uh, yeah. Or attending one play per month. A great set point here is to read at least two books per month. Mm -hmm. I think I cool. have that so down. Like, yeah. Uh, it sounds um, like you already added one in mind. Yeah. I mean, so one of the things I do, so I'm just going to plug. We are not sponsored by anybody, um, but I do like plugging sources of just knowledge and wisdom that I find fantastic. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the great courses. Um, if you've ever read like National Geographic or something, they'll have ads. So it used to be a kind of thing where you, you know, you get, and I guess it still is, you can still get their catalog and um, you know, pay them money and you they'll send you either... Um, you know, audio, like CD, it used to be CDs and DVDs primarily. I think it was even tape cassettes, like way, way back. Um, I, I think they existed in the 90s. And actually, I think we actually have somewhere like a set of tape cassettes from, um, from way back. But they're just, you know, they're college level courses that are produced really well. Like, you know, you have a bunch of um, free court, um, websites online that will have like lectures. And they'll kind of just be in a classroom, you know, with a a video recording that's all you know not super high quality it's just a lecture uh, they've recorded straight up so these guys some of them are like that um, but some of them are really well produced so you'll get the lecture like you'll get a set of DVDs and you'll it'll just be a set of lectures and they'll have um, you know they'll have like visual aids and they'll be in nice 30 minute chunks so it's kind of you know, it's set out for somebody going into a course that has very little experience. Some of the more advanced ones, like if you're, um, if you're doing the chemistry one, they might expect you to have some knowledge of, you know, basic mathematics or even not so basic mathematics, like algebra and, uh, you know, trig and, and, and stuff like that. But they are set up so that somebody who has a very basic knowledge can kind of go in and get a full experience out of them. And so recently, in the last few years, I think they made a service called The Great Courses Plus, and it, it it is basically like the Netflix of college lectures, basically. So they have like uh, I don't know, they must have a couple hundred different lecture series. Um, you know, most of the lecture series are anywhere from twelve hours to you know thirty or forty hours. Some of them are have a lot of courses in them. And it's just set up like Netflix. You pay $15 a month and you get access to all of them. And considering a lot of these lecture courses used to be like $100 to buy just one of the lecture courses, it's an insane deal. Um, yeah. It's absolutely insane. There's so much. They're like, they're literally be any something for everybody. So, um, yeah, it's literally like a college curriculum for 15 a month. Yeah. And, and you know, obviously some things you, you don't get as much like actual homework to do or yeah. coursework. Um, you don't get that direct interaction from the professor but it it's really good if you just you know i recently went through just a series on buddhism because i want to know a little bit more that you know i am a buddhist but i want to know some more of the history of buddhism mm -hmm. um you know just different I, I some of the sects of buddhism like tibetan and uh 
Zen Buddhism I just didn't know as much about, so I just kind of wanted to get the whole history. That was great. I can just, you know, go on to the account that we have and just... Yeah. watch uh, a well-produced series on Buddhism. No, I definitely ever you've mentioned it before every time you bring it up I'm like I really need to get on that love yeah. those but uh, I don't know do you know if there's a like a PayPal option for that basically my barrier like that's definitely affordable but I don't actually have a credit card right now because to have a credit card you need to be a resident of the country that's issuing it and right now I'm mm. technically a resident of nowhere I'm not a resident of Canada anymore, but I'm not yet a resident of Mexico, although I am in the process of that, and hopefully soon yeah. I will be. I mean, but... you, might, you might be able to just get the password mm. from our mom, because that's what I'm using. Um, oh, for sure. In any case, uh... yeah, no, it's great, but bringing it back to my intellectual life, so I already kind of, when... I've done a lot of dishes in my life. Like, I actually sat down and calculated, you know, I used to do them when I was younger, uh, you know, I do the family dishes, like you did as well. And then uh, most of my jobs have had me doing dishes in some capacity, and I don't always end up being the one who can do them, or not end up being the one. Like, I often take over that job, partially because it's, you know, you can practice mindfulness while doing the dishes. It's mm -hmm. something where there's not a lot of stuff going on, but you're you're still active, so you can get very zen about it. You can really, you know, you can clear your mind, just be in the moment, and it's great practice uh, because it's kind of a it's a time slot what you're not really doing anything else with anyway it's something that for a lot of people is a little boring just like you know meditation for some people is a little bit boring but you can kind of stack some things on top of each other and make use of a time you know when your mind's kind of available but so recently I, I've started um, not even recently but for quite a few months now I've been just um, watching a, an episode of whatever lecture series I'm watching um, currently while I'm doing the dishes, uh, which I think is a great use of time. Um, but, you know, considering that when I calculated it out, I've done something like 4,000 hours of doing dishes in my life. Like, you know, that's... I, I think of all the knowledge that I could have crammed into my mind if I had been making use of that time. It just kind of goes yeah. to show, you know, I'm I'm very much about kind of make you know I'm, sometimes this can be a detriment but I'm all about like making the most efficient use of all the time no, I for have. For sure, that's I mean but, that's how I got into podcasts. Like sometimes I show people my feed and it's like wow you're subscribed to like forty different podcast mm -hmm. feeds that's insane and I'm like is it though when you think of how much time in your day is just dead space like you can actually learn a lot. Yeah, just so. traveling on the bus, um, you know, doing mm -hmm. dishes, you know, all the taking out the trash. Things. Yeah, uh, yeah, there is so much extra time to make use of. And so, yeah, so I, what I'm just going to say, since I already kind of have this as something I'm doing every day, but, you know, most every day, but I think I would like to even do every day, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, just at lunchtime, after lunch, when I'm doing the dishes, I'm just going to you know, watch one episode of a lecture. Um, I'm just going to say five days a week, because sometimes I do like to listen to music or something like that, but... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. So that was just one one lecture a day? One lecture a day at awesome. lunch, or while well, I'm doing this, just... Cool. All right. Let's see, what's next? Okay, for me, next up was skills. So... Your skills. Some examples are commit to spending a certain number of hours per week reading or studying material to improve skills in your field. I have a set point of taking off one day per month from work to focus on studying and learning how to work better. Uh, all right. So like I mentioned, I have some skills that are just like hobbies. They're uh, not anything I would use for my career, just things that I like being good at for their own sake. That piano, photography, drawing, things like that. I think the one I most would like to get back on top of would be piano. Um, I was never like amazing at piano or anything, but it was something that at some point I was reasonably good at it where I could hear a song I like, sit down and learn to play it. And that's just really fun and like relaxing. And I feel like it did add a lot to my life. So uh, at this, at the, what's the word I'm looking for? Risk. At the risk of being redundant, I think 
I'm going to just adapt the same one for writing, which is that I should sit down and practice the piano every day. Uh, I do find I've tried to set amounts of times for it before, like, oh, I should be practicing half an hour every day, which is what my music teacher taught me when I was little. But then again, half an hour can seem like too much when I have a busy day. So just literally I should sit down and practice. Just yeah, yeah, I can even play see a note, play a scale. Have it, yeah, I was gonna kind of say like you know just similar to just just writing a a word thing. Um, you could even just say like I need to sit down and play a note. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I feel you know, like every all the ways that you kind of explained how just writing one word can kind of get you kicked off, like you know, probably for sure. Hey, let's not make it too easy. I'll play a chord. How's oh, that? there you go. A triad. And now we're getting somewhere. All right. Um, Already. Um, next. Or sorry, did he have more to say on that, or should we go into your? No, I, I think I'm ready for my last one. Um, awesome. So, so that's career. This is the one that is most yeah, difficult. Yeah. This for you. one, I'm gonna. Yeah, it's gonna be a little hard. I, obviously, I have you know. I have rated my career as a two on my, you know, areas of balance. So, out of ten. And again, if yes. you haven't been following the podcast the whole time, uh, we uh, a few weeks ago we did an exercise where we went through these areas of balance and just rated on a scale of one to ten where we think we are. So, Alaric has re- rated his career a two out of ten mm-hmm. in his satisfaction with that area of his life. Yes. So sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. So I, yeah, I was just yeah. gonna say is, you know, obviously I'm having some issues with this. I, you know, I'm going to try to establish a set point, which is just you know a minimum amount I want to, uh, you know, do to kind of improve this area of my life, and kind of when I look at it, it's one that I go like, hmm, you know, what is a reasonable minimum to be working on? Like, what is even something I can be working on? Like, isn't this something that just kind of sort of happens organically? You know, obviously just making up a lot of uh, excuses um, to start out. Um, yeah. You know, that's how my mind works some ways, but I'm sure we can come up with some solutions. For sure. So what does our book have to say about career? All right. Career. Join a professional group and make sure you go to a certain number of meetings per year. Read one book per month on career issues. Hmm. If you're looking to change careers, commit to reading a certain number of articles online per week about this new field and how to break in. So, I guess, yeah, you're not entirely, haven't entirely nailed down what you want your career to be, right? Yeah, so I guess I'll give a little bit of um, background about why, you know, I rate my career as a two. So, as I've talked about before, you know, had some addiction issues in the past, quit my job to just kind of sort that all out, you know, sorted that all out. I'm luckily have now seven months into recovery, doing great. You know, I just took some time off work because that's actually one of the things that apparently many, many people have issues with once they kind of uh, get clean and they're in recovery. A lot of people will jump right back into work and it goes horribly. Right. Um, and so, yeah, now I'm finally at the point where I'm kind of thinking about, you know, getting back to work, establishing my career. But the thing about career is I've never, I've never, I've never been at a job that kind of gets me going in a way where I've been like, yeah, this is what I want to be doing for the rest of my life. So this isn't even necessarily about getting back to a baseline of mine. This is about going further than I ever had before and, you know, and that I need to find out what really kind of... Uh, you know, gets me going, what what kind of job I should have. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be a job. So a career kind of for me is just, you know, it's sort of how, you know, the way I w- in which I live my life to allow me to, ma- you know, make it through life comfortably. Um, mm-hmm. And so it kind of has all these different parts. Obviously, there's the money aspect, um, you know, my career once I have my career, I want it to be something where I'm actively putting good out into the world. Or if I'm not putting good into the world, I'm at least doing good for myself and hopefully, you know, my immediate, um, my just like microcosm of everything that has to do with me, my friends, family. Um, so sure. yeah, I mean, obviously that's a little bit of a tall order, but I guess here we're just trying to set some, you know, minimums. What can I be doing to work towards that? 
Exactly, yeah. So I guess, you know, one area I can kind of identify right away since I don't really know what I want to be doing with my life. Like, you know, I guess I have some ideas, but, you know, maybe working on identifying, you know, putting some time aside exactly. in some way to identify what is it that I, you know, what what could I possibly do, be doing with my life? Um, Definitely. And I guess what we're doing here, while it's, you know, it would be awesome if sometime this evolved into something that was a career. Uh, you know, uh, my career in general doesn't have to be necessarily one individual thing. This could also be something where I'm saying, uh, or I say, what I'm doing right now with this podcast is building skills towards something I would like to be doing um, in the future. Definitely. Um, so I guess I could part of, count as part of my career. And... I guess, you know, I, we can set multiple set points, too, right, for any of these issues. Yeah, any of definitely. These areas. So, it's easiest to start with one, but... Yeah, I, I mean, I'm kind of looking at this and just going, yeah, maybe I should just say, like, every single Wednesday, Thursday, I will be doing, you know, part one of our weekly episode. Um, Perfect. I mean, I'd like to have that be two days, but... You know, just since this is a set point, this is the bare minimum, um, yep. I'm just going to go with that for now. And I'm going to do a little bit of thinking on this um, while you kind of go with your next one. Awesome. Actually, before I get to the next one, so like I said, we're not going to be going through all because that is a lot. But we do have a few people in our chat today. If any of them have an area of balance that they would like to focus on, I can read the examples from that one just as a bonus. So I'll put that out there now so you guys can think about that. Um, meanwhile, I will jump into my final one, which was social life. So we've both talked about, we both sort of have a similar thing when it comes to our social life. It's something we've been talking about a lot this segment, just in how we tend to be very driven and very driven to be productive, especially we feel like anytime we're you know, all our time has to be for something, which does kind of come at the expense of neglecting our social lives, where anytime I'm like, oh, I could go out and hang out with people or just do something fun, I'm like, or I could be working on the blog or writing. So it's definitely something I need to, you know, prioritize uh, uh -huh. more. It's, yeah, we've talked about it a bit before. We're kind of my problem, like, I would rate my social life kind of low, even though I wouldn't say I'm too dissatisfied with it, but that's almost the problem. The fact that I'm not dissatisfied with not being very social is something I do need to work on in myself. Right. Um, it is It is kind of a tricky one to come up with set points, though. You can't just say, like, oh, I'm going to hang out with friends every this day at this time, because obviously friends have schedules, too. And, yeah. So I guess I will, or sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, but, you know, even though we might not be able to set a, um, a specific time, um, you know, to hang out with friends, I, I think it is even reasonable to say, like, yeah, I'm going, maybe even something as simple, this is actually something I'd like to be doing um, with my social life. There are a couple friends of which I would like to at least be just texting them, you know, just to say hi. At the very least, you know, possibly even going as far as actually there's one friend I think I would like to be calling at least once per week. Um, just because we do often just call each other just to say hi and talk about what's going on. But without sort of having that structure, it's, you know, it's very easy for that to kind of fall, fall off. Um, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's see what he has to say about, I've been calling it social, he actually called it friendships. So your friendships, create set points for keeping in touch. For example, calling a close friend at least once a week. Well, there you go. Oh, there you uh, go. Inviting friends for brunch or dinner once a month. Writing a short weekly note to someone going through a tough time. Right. Um, so that did one. Did you like, have any? Uh, just more the, to say about that, just while I, while I type out what the options are in the chat. Um, no, I was just going to kind of like ask about the writing a note for somebody who's going through a tough time. That, I mean, for a set point, that seems a little, a little strange. Um, well, not strange exactly. Oh, like, yeah. yeah, that's, 
How is that a minimum that you could be doing? Like, you know, that's a one-time thing, kind of. I mean, it's definitely something you should do if you have a friend who's going through a hard time. Right. I think that's maybe... Maybe an example of, like, your set point could be to do one thing a week, like, like so all those things listed, like... Right, okay. One of those things, I guess. I see. Would... Yeah, okay, makes sense. I hadn't thought of that. Just reach out to a friend in some some manner once per week. For sure. Okay, sorry Oops. about that. Um... So I think for me, yeah, it would be something like, so I've mentioned before, I've moved around a lot. I mean, until recently, I lived in Canada, and then I moved to Mexico. Uh, before that, I lived in several cities in Canada. So, uh, yeah, I have a lot of friends. Like, I've had a lot of close friends in all those places, but then it kind of you kind of don't keep in contact regularly. So I think my set point would be to just keep in touch with one friend, even if it's just sending a message or having a very quick conversation, I should try to keep in touch with at least one old friend each week, just kind of keep those friendships alive. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, just for, yeah, I kind of addressing the chat. So yeah, the set point is, um, when you're establishing a set point, it's just what you want the bare minimum to be. So it could be once a week for any of these given things. That doesn't mean you only do it once per week necessarily. It's That's what you're aiming for the minimum to be. So you could even start out by saying once per month is like the bare minimum you want. Um, obviously, you might be aiming for, um, you know, a higher amount. But one of the one of the biggest issues that people have when they're trying to attempt new things especially well especially in a, like when you're working on self-improvement um when you're trying to incorporate new exercises or habits or anything like that one of the biggest mistakes people make are just overshooting um saying exactly. something like you know from right out of the gate i'm going to be doing yoga for an hour per day in the morning every single day um you know, Definitely. that might be where, you know, that might be the ideal that they're shooting for, but it's extremely unlikely that you're going to get through the first couple of days without just, you know, stopping. So it's much more, or I, I go use meditation as an example because it's, well, it's very popular these days as um, a, a habit or a, a tool that people use. Um, and it's also one people have a really hard time with because people, even setting a goal for just 15 minutes a day, or even just a couple days a week, can just be way too much for some people. Because um, honestly, meditation is really hard. Um, you know, as I kind of said earlier, like I still have, you know, I've been doing it for eight years and I still have issues setting down for more than 15 minutes sometimes. You know, there are days right. when I can sit for a couple hours, but there are, you know, there are days when that, that's just not possible. Um, so when I started meditation, I, you know, constantly was trying to do 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you know, 10 minutes every day. And eventually, once it really, really stuck was when I was just like, okay, I'm just going to sit for three minutes every day. And that's it. Um, because once I started, you know, just doing that for three minutes per day, um, immediately, first I was hitting my goal each day, which felt great. Like, you know, I only had to sit for 180 seconds before ding, you know, that goal is checked off. Um, and then there's not the pressure, like, you know, you, you hit those goals. So even if you only do the three minutes, the, the repetition, getting into the habit of it, you know, that consistency is the most important. Everything else will follow if you have that consistency. Um, so, you know, this concept of set points, I hadn't heard it, you know, I hadn't heard the name set points before, but it, you know, it's one I'm familiar with because I, I think it is a really good strategy to, to set this minimum that you can't fail at, or, you know, at least it would be really hard to fail at because, yeah. you know, uh, that gets you in the habit of, or, you know, not even necessarily, humans do much better with reward than with punishment. So if you set yourself like a goal of, you know, doing 15 minutes per day, um, there's not really a punishment per se, it's just you're much more likely to fail. And when you fail, that has a, you know, a negative connotation. So you could kind of look at it two ways have the goal to do five you know 15 minutes of meditation every day and then you could end up doing five minutes of meditation 
every day for a week, and then it feels like you failed seven days in a row. But mm -hmm. if that you know your goal is to do three minutes every day for a week, and then you did five minutes for a week, not only have you succeeded seven days in a row, you've actually gone you know you've overachieved seven days in a row, and you haven't done anything different. It's just how you're looking at it. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's really yeah reframing it can be really powerful. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, you know, we, once per week is fine, once a month is fine. Um, you know, just whatever you feel like is probably I'd take whatever you feel is comfortable for you and then even dial it back a little from even, there. Yeah, do a little less than that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. So the chat hasn't gone back with which bonus one. It sounds like mostly they would want to focus on ones we've already talked about, but I'll give them a little more time while, if they want to choose one to move on to the next step, which is test your set points and correct if you miss. So, for example, the author tests his 50 push-up set point once a week. If he can't do 50, whether because he's been slacking on exercise or put on weight, he immediately starts working on getting back to that point. Um, so, for example, for fitness, he does what he needs to do to get back to the state where he can do 50 push-ups. Uh, what works for him is to immediately go on a low-carb diet. I think we're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. uh, to get his weight back to normal and commit to working out at the gym three times per week. Typically, in one week, he's back to being able to do 50. Um, so, yeah, basically, when you slip up, when you fail your set point, you have to have something in mind to be able to get back to that. So... It's kind of different for us. I feel like all of ours are things we want to do consistently rather than a certain target, like being able to do 50 push-ups that we would slip below. Uh -huh. um, but I guess we can brainstorm if we have any correction methods. Like if you find you start not watching a lecture every day or you're not uh, writing every day, how could you get back on schedule? Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my first thing would just be to look at, you know, what I'm doing, what my set points are, and just go, like, you know, eh, I guess, is this reasonable? Should I just, you know, scale it back a little? You know, because as I was saying before, I just want to make sure I'm succeeding. Um, no matter, you know, what my set points are or what I'm doing, I just want to make sure I'm succeeding every day, at least. Um, and I guess the other thing, too, is just kind of looking at, like, because obviously I'll have the things that I have set points up for and things that I have goals for, and then other things like, you know, I'm going to be approaching this exercise that, you know, I have these three set points that I'm going to want to be hitting, but I still have all this other stuff I'm doing. You know, I'm reading my books, I'm doing other, I'm doing Khan Academy, trying to learn a language, um, you know, doing this podcast, all those other things. Um, and I might look at, you know, should I kind of refocus my efforts? So should I drop some of this other stuff while I just focus on the thing, you know, the things I'm trying to achieve for my set points? Um, yeah, I mean, I think th that's what kind of pops out at me immediately. I mean, obviously, there's just the try harder <laughs> thing, but that's not really. Yeah, I mean, maybe look at just what I'm doing elsewhere in my life. Like, you know, am I just getting enough sleep? Am I feeding myself properly? You know, am I doing all the the maintenance things that I need to be doing every day? Um, Definitely. Yeah. Other than that, I mean, what were you thinking? Uh, uh, well, for me, kind of similar to what you were saying, it's kind of carving out a different time to do it. So for example, I think a way you could get even more specific is, like you were talking about, do you need to dial back some other things? So maybe if you have time set aside for other things, like you're reading, if you're not hitting your set points in those areas, maybe you say, like, well, I don't get to read today. I'm going to replace the time I would normally read with this thing that I missed. Um, just a suggestion. I don't know if that works for you. Yeah. But what I'm thinking, it is easier if you have one, like, uh, his example, where it's like you should be able to do 50 push-ups, like a measurable thing like that. Uh, but I think what would work for all of mine is I sh should set aside a time. I think for me it would be right before bed where if I'm not keeping up with my set points, then right before the be bed is when I would do them. And that would be the absolute minimum. Like maybe right before I go to sleep, I 
we'll take that time to reflect on did I do everything I was supposed to do? If not, I'll literally open up my computer, write one word, close it, go to the piano, play like one scale. And then if I haven't messaged a friend that week, I'll message a friend if it's a reasonable hour. Right. Uh, time zones help with that. It's Pacific time is earlier than where I am. So if I'm going to bed, it will still be early evening there. And yeah, just before bed, do literally the absolute minimum, not trying to overshoot it at all. Yeah. So I think that's what my procedure would be. I guess too, maybe even look, just looking at how I have my set points laid out and just go like, you know, maybe it is, I, I don't think I'd have issues watching a lecture, you know, while I'm doing the dishes, but if that wasn't working for some reason, you know, is there another time that might work better for those things on a regular basis? Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. If I'm in mean, kind of the core of what he's getting to here with his example is if you start failing your set point, and again, these should be things easily achievable. So if you start failing the evil, easily achievable goal, you need to immediately start looking at why and what needs to change. Right. Um, cool. So uh, backtracking a little, the chat has chosen adventure as the bonus. Yes. Uh, which I think is yeah. a good choice. We've talked about before. That's the one I would rate as like a 10. Or actually, I would rate it as a 9 out of 10 for myself because I love adventure so much that I want to have even more than I have. I think you said you would rate it as an 11 out of 10. Me? Uh, adventure? No, you, well, for me, you would Oh, rate. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you're doing pretty well on adventure. Yeah, adventure is one where that's at four for me. Definitely. Maybe yeah. one of those a bit cool. trickier ones, but... So I you'll think... definitely benefit from this, too. And actually, mm -hmm. it's funny you say tricky. I would actually think this would be an easy one for you because you could literally just say, I should just go somewhere I haven't been. Every yeah, I mean, um, that, that is true. Yeah, maybe not... Certainly too measurable. Too. Maybe not easy to execute, but easy to measure. Mm-hmm. So, cool. So, your adventures. Consider setting set points for the frequency of holidays or adventure trips. I go on at least two long trips with my entire family every year. Uh, we don't have to be going somewhere exotic or expensive, but by committing to extended time with my family, I have a chance to show them how much I love them while we create lasting memories together. You can commit to going to one new place every month, even if that place is somewhere in your neighborhood. It doesn't have to cost any money at all, but your world will feel bigger and brighter when you regularly expose yourself to new corners of it. Yeah. So obviously he started with a kind of grander example of like not everyone can afford to take two trips with their family. But I would say literally, it can sound silly, but you could literally even just say like go to a new location in your neighborhood. Like if you always go to one coffee shop, try a different coffee shop. And it's that's something I've gotten really good at since I moved here to Mexico City is going and exploring uh, all the new places. Like my girlfriend and I joke that in the almost two years I've been here, like I've discovered more places in Mexico city or we've discovered more places together than she has like the entire lifetime she's lived yeah. here. Um, but it is, it is literally like that actually is the way to discover all the like little treasures and like become the person that your friends go to for like, Hey, what's a cool place to go? Because if you just don't always go to the same place, if you just occasionally try a new place, even if it doesn't look that great, you just discover all these magical little places that you never would have found. So yeah. Yeah. Well, when we were talking about our, um, you know, our just models of reality, basically, like, you know, for me, adventure really is that. It's just doing anything that's new. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. obviously when you hear of adventure, you kind of have the connotation of something grand, epic almost. Um, but I really even, you know, just even my thing where I went down to the beach and just looked at cool rocks today. Like, that's kind of an adventure. I'm exploring something. You know, it's an adventure for me because I'm... I, I never really just looked at all the rocks in the sand. Like, I've looked at them, but I never really considered, you know, just looking at them, I look at all the different rocks, you have all the colors, shape, you know, I don't, I'm not a geologist, so I don't know what all the rocks are, but I can kind of imagine, like, where they'd come from. You know, when you just Definitely. look at all the different kinds that are there, they've all come from different layers of the earth or different conditions, probably, you know, from millions of years apart. And so you just kind of... You know, exploring with my mind the rocks on the beach, like that. You know, that was just kind of an adventure in and of itself. Um, so I guess, yeah, it doesn't necessarily. I don't think it needs to be super hard. Um, yeah, you know, definitely. That's the was... point. Like, you can have goals for these big, grand adventures and traveling the world, but uh, yeah, keep it minimal at first. Like, if you start by doing little adventures and just like, oh, I'm gonna go explore the neighborhood this time, and then next time maybe, oh, I'll go explore somewhere a little further away in the city and then maybe next time you go to the next city over and you know the more you go on these little adventures the easier and easier it will get to go on the bigger ones and then you'll be there so for sure yeah hopefully that helps any listeners who would like to focus on adventure in their life mm -hmm. all right so the final uh the final step in this exercise is turning up the heat so we've mentioned mostly this unlike goals goals are to push you forward mostly this is to keep you where you're at 
but there is actually a little bonus mechanic in here that does push you forward too. So anytime you slip up, you do like we talked about, you try to correct uh, your life so you get back to where your set point was, but then also you push it up by like one degree, like one minimum degree. So his example is anytime he slips up and he can't do 50 push-ups, he has to get back to there and then he actually gets back to 51 push-ups, mm. which is a minuscule difference. Like if you can do 50 push-ups regularly, you can almost certainly do 51, but you just make like the most minuscule uh, improvement, which does two things. One, it obviously helps you keep continuously improving. Two, it completely changes the psychology. You kind of address this with reframing it, where normally when you fail, you feel like you feel really crappy and it can sometimes make you want to give up because it just doesn't feel good. So in this case, you turn your failure into becoming even better than before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, he has a little note here. So not a, you've now you've not just prevented stagnation; you're actually growing. Uh, most people slip with age, but when you apply non-negotiable set points, you grow with age. Hmm. So yeah, that's a really good way of looking at it, I think. So yeah, we can just sure. uh, for you, for example, uh, if you just choose one of your areas you wanted to focus in this week yeah the ones we've been talking about for the set points if you just choose one um let's just let's go with creative life cool so your goal for creative life was three times a week you wanted to spend 30 minutes working on your novel indeed all right so if you slip up uh i mean we could just say add an extra minute or yeah. what do you think 31 I, I think that's reasonable if i slip up yeah. gotta do 31 minutes awesome and if you slip up one time, like it's a tiny difference each time, but if you sleep up 10 times, then you'll be at 40. And right. that's a significant, that's an extra half an hour a week. That's like sitting down a whole extra day. Yeah, so sure. cool. Awesome. For me, I think I'll pick, uh, yeah, let's, I'll go with creativity too. I'll just add an extra word. I start by writing one word. If I slip up, then I have to write two. And knowing me, I'll probably slip up a hundred times and get to a hundred. So that's great. Well, there you go. Make cool. progress. And I would say I called it a bonus. Like, it is part of the exercise. I would say if that overwhelms you or whatever, like that is kind of the lead integral part of the exercise, I think. So mm -hmm. do that if it appeals to you. But again, the main thing is just setting a minimum and holding yourself to it. Yeah, I, I definitely think it shouldn't feel punishing. Like, I mean, that's kind of the thing about it being such a small, like the fact that you're adding an extra minute or an extra word or whatever it is on to what your set point is, you know, it's kind of, you're getting that idea of oh you know now i've got to do more but it should be in a in a fun you know mostly fun and funny way since it, you know it's more yeah. but it's such a small amount so you know it shouldn't be anything that's stressful for sure exactly it shouldn't be an issue i don't know why i have this feeling i guess just when i was reading the exercise the first time i kind of had it in my mind like this is a really simple exercise and this is the one point where i could see it just getting almost too overcomplicated. so mm -hmm. i mean if it's maybe that's just me and if it's not for you then great but if you do get that feeling, then that's not the integral part of the exercise. Definitely. Cool. So yeah, as usual, we've way overshot the time we said we were going to do for this. I know you're not feeling too great yeah. still. So, so I, I think, yeah, we've actually managed to go two hours just yeah. doing wow. um, <laughs> that one little section. Um, yeah, uh, that's fine. Yeah, I think this is normally our short segment. Uh, yeah. So I think we will call it there for today. Um, Awesome. As you were saying, we might we're not going to put any specific times on it just for this week. So we're going to we're going to be trying to get our schedule down finally just to doing Thursday at did you say 11 still? Or... Yeah, so 11 a.m. PST. Yeah, Pacific and then time. I guess however many hours you wanted to go for or yeah, however long I mean, it to get the segments. Pretty much. I mean, I'd probably somewhere between three to four hours. Sure. Um, and then we'll be also be doing Sunday, same time as we started today, 5.30. For sure. So yeah, also Pacific time. Yeah. But in between now and Pacific. Thursday, we will be attempting to finish up this week's episode. Or I guess, yeah. yeah, this week is going to be a little scattered. We're just trying to get this episode out before we start the next one. But starting this week, we should have a consistent streaming schedule if you want to stop by and watch live. Or if you're just listening to the podcast that I should be able to get those up relatively consistently too. Yeah. Uh, and I promise gonna... an actual RSS feed is coming, but yeah. 
yeah. Hopefully we'll start getting YouTube videos up so if you wanted to watch the actual. And also Twitch. For sure. I now have Twitch set up to be recording VODs. Um, I think they do only hang around for a few weeks right now. Yeah. But we will be getting those on YouTube soon as well. For sure. But basically Thursday 11 to uh, 11 to 2 or 3, so 3 or 4 hours. That's when we'll be doing the bulk of the show. And then on Sundays, we'll start at 5.30 and probably only go for an hour or so. And that will just be finishing it up. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we'll be uh, closing out with our personal segments probably on those days. So where we just talk about whatever. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, still for, for this week, we should be getting... We still have to talk about For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. Um, We've got a little bit of World of Warcraft talk. Uh, Obviously, there's a new expansion out. It's pretty cool. Got some thoughts on that. You know, a bunch of stuff to talk about there. Um, I'll be talking a little bit just about attention um, and how I feel it is a, you know, a resource that can be drained. You know, it's a resource that's being... um, commoditized more and more in our North American society um, and you know all the fun stuff that goes along with that and you will be talking sure. about uh, yeah kind of what I'm doing with the blog which is right. I've started a daily blog again and I'm doing uh, well six different weekly columns because one of them spans two days so two posts a week uh, yeah but just six different topics kind of like this podcast that I'm doing every week so I'll talk about where I'm at with those and where to go in the future and yeah, that should be fun. All right, cool. Until then, uh, thank you to the chat room for joining us. Thank you for listeners at home for listening. Uh, Alaric, did you have any final thoughts? Um, any last words? I'm afraid I might end up going off on a tangent if All I right. talk too much. But uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks to everybody who joined us. Thanks for uh, participating. For everybody who did, um, hope you enjoyed, and I hope you will join us next time. Awesome. Buenas noches y hasta luego. All right.